In this presentation, we're going to talk about the use of dynamic aortic imaging, focusing on dynamic CT for the detection and treatment of endoleaks. We have a number of conflicts with industry partners. Some of this was developed in conjunction with Siemens, uh, in robotics with Corindus, and recordings with Storz. We think of imaging in its continuity, and it's obviously important to choose the right diagnostic tool at the right phase uh, of the treatment modality. But CT is, is very flexible and is really the workhorse. We, of course, in the past have been interested in dynamic MR, and here you can see an example basically of a dynamic obstruction of the left renal artery uh, from a descending type B dissection. Um, not only does it show you anatomy, it's also physiologic. You can calculate um, flow velocities within this. But the problem with MR is it's very limited to where the local expertise happens to be. CT, of course, is much more generally applicable. We've developed this idea that really one view is no view. So uh, if you this type A dissection with a dynamic CT, depending on what phase of the cardiac cycle, you may get completely different measurements when you're trying to size this uh, for a stent graft. Nobody would ever think of looking at heart valve disease, for example, with a static imaging. It has to be dynamic. And the aortic disease is amongst the most dynamic disease processes that you and I really have to deal, deal with. And so EVAR follow-up can be used in a variety of different ways, basically using ultrasound, triphasic CTA, and DSA if we're going to think about intervening. A lot of this can be provided really with dynamic or what we call time-resolved CTA. So if you look at the graphic in the upper right-hand corner, we're not scanning the entire patient. Let's say we want to focus you know, on that block that represents the abdomen. And we're essentially shuttling the patient in and out. In this case, you can see over a 27 second cycle. A lot of this was developed for cardiac imaging. And you can see cardiac imaging at the bottom uh, where you can actually see the right side of the heart filling closer into the left side of the heart. But of course, that's not what we are interested in. We're interested in how an aortic aneurysm and an aortic endograph fills. So, so let's just show you basically some examples of this. Again, we're scanning from time zero, top left, to time 52 seconds. And what that does is you move the patient in and out of the scanner. It gives you different snapshots throughout the cycle. You can set exactly when you want to acquire these images and allows you to see the dye. Uh, first of all, not even in the aneurysm or in the, the limbs of the endograph. Then the endograph starts filling. And then later at 20 seconds, you can see the right uh, third and fourth lumbar arteries beginning to appear at T12 to T20 seconds. And then when you follow it at T36 seconds, T52, you start seeing the aneurysm sac. Now, depending upon whether you take a snapshot in any part of the cycle, you may see parts of this. And when we get delayed CTAs, that is often basically fairly randomly selected. Whereas when you're doing it this way, you can actually see the flow pattern. So think of it here as a series basically of snapshots which you can put together to make a movie. Dies in the SMA, dies in the proximal aortic in uh, the neck and then the aortic endograph where it divides. And then as you follow this through, you see more dye arriving. And then you can see dye behind the neck. It may look like a type 1 endoleak, it's actually a, a renal vein. And that's the other advantage. It's a retroaortic left renal vein. And one of the other advantages of this is that you can, can reconstruct this in, th in three dimensions and know exactly where it is. And now we're getting further out into the cycle and you're going to start seeing dye appearing basically in the posterior aspect of the aneurysm. But there, although we take more scans, we focus it on a particular area of interest. We really don't care what's going on in the spleen of the liver. We want to know what's going on. And so you can see here basically that the amount of dye that is utilized and the amount of radiation when you focus it like this is actually not any increased. Now, the other nice part about this is you can look at the dye arrival time. So here you can see a yellow circle and a green circle. What we're quantitating is the change in Hounsfield units uh, throughout that particular region of interest with time. And so by analyzing each of these time curves, you get a pretty good idea of what kind of endoleak you're actually dealing with. Here's type 1 endoleak, for example. And you can see dye arrives in the aura, dye arrives in the aneurysm sac almost simultaneously. Pretty likely it's a type 1 endoleak. You can confirm this by looking, uh, by quantitating this, and you can see that the red area where the dye was arriving in the aneurysm sac was the same time as it comes down through the endograph. Pretty likely it's a type 1 end leak. It's confirmed uh, by the anatomical imaging. As a control, you can choose one of the lumbar arteries, for example, and you can see the time curves basically are shifted. Here's an example of a type 2 end leak. And here you can see dye, it looks like it's refluxing from inferior, like approximately, could be a type 1B, but it's not. When you actually look at the dye arrival curves, 
you see that the die base, then the time of die arrival is shifted way to the patient's right. So both anatomical imaging and you can uh, quantitate these, these die arrival times. Type 3 endoleaks are not very common, but they tend to be a little bit more closer to a type 1 endoleak than a type 2 endoleak. And you can actually analyze these. We see this is one of the things that will come out basically in a publication, um, and there's really not a lot of difference in the radiation. Now, one of the nice things about this is you can also use all of these images to actually guide an intervention. So let's say we're going to try basically and, and embolize. Uh, lumbar artery. Because we've got all these different time points, we can actually show the dye, we can fuse these images, and then it allows us to plot, in this case, this red line, which goes basically from the internal iliac artery, where the catheter is, ascending lumbar, into the right lumbar, into the aneurysm sac. And then it's just a matter of whether or not you can actually track a catheter along what are sometimes fairly tortuous courses. So in conclusion, dynamic CTA can accurately, accurately characterize endoleak type and inflow. It has similar radiation exposure to standard triphasic CTA. It can be used to guide subsequent interventions and dynamic CTA can be widely performed in conventional scanners. And I'll finish off basically with letting you look at this. This is when you put it together with a uh, multiplanar reconstruction surface rendered images and you can actually see die arriving through the, the lower lumbar arteries, blooming up through the aneurysm sac and going out in this case through an L3. And that allows us to very specifically understand these flow patterns. Thank you very much for your attention.